Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, let's wrap up today with uh, yet another AI talk. Uh, GLA started as a weekend project about uh, two years ago following the release of ChatGPT and uh, their API. Uh, it was just a weekend project I did in my uh, personal work, so it has nothing to do with my day job. And uh, just another thing to note is that uh, in this presentation, whenever I uh, mention honeypot, I mean research honeypots, and uh, these are honeypots you externally expose to the internet to capture internet-wide scans. And it's not, uh, uh, we're not referring to internal honeypots for intrusion detection. Uh, let's start by an example. Uh, this is a, a global protect zero day exploit I caught my honeypot. And, uh, yeah, I thought, like, wouldn't it be cool if we could automatically on the fly generate a response for this, uh, instead of manually creating a response for that? Because, like, you never know what uh, vulnerabilities come and, uh, you can't, uh, emulate all the applications and vulnerabilities out there. So, uh, after releasing these, uh, vulnerabilities, it might be too late to, uh, emulate something to capture the attempts. Like, if I'm the attacker, I won't uh, start, and I have like an end day exploit, I won't start uh, scanning the internet after the release of the uh, adversary to, for example, find the potentially vulnerable systems. I probably instead use uh, Shodan or Senses to find uh, potential targets which have been around for a longer time. Uh, here's actually the AI generated response uh, to that request. Uh, what I like about it is actually the CSS and the styles here. So it's pretty cool. Like it's not the perfect replica for a global project, but it's convincing enough for uh, the attacker to start like, interacting more with the honeypot and maybe uh, sending the second stages and stuff like that. Uh, another important thing to note is that uh, not all the attacks or scans or uh, exploitation attempts out there uh, has multiple attempts, multiple stages, and uh, most of them actually are just randomly and blindly uh, send their payloads to whatever system they find. So. In those cases, uh, generating realistically looking responses might not be interesting. Uh, but in the cases where the attacker looks for specific uh, system through Shodan, you can, like, or senses, you can actually manipulate uh, those systems' uh, view of your honeypot pretty easy this way. And uh, to be honest, the responses aren't that great always. There are examples like this, which uh, there was a log4j exploit attempt, which uh, you see the response here is not that great. If you can't read that, don't worry, I have a larger version in the next page. So you see in this case the response was, we detected a suspicious request, we blocked it, and unauthorized attempt will result in legal uh, action. So that's probably not what you honeypot uh, want, what you want your honeypot to generate. With that, uh, let's have a quick intro and get it started. Uh, so I'm Adel Karimi. Uh, I've been working in uh, detection and response area for about a decade in companies like Google, Facebook, and, uh, sorry, Facebook, uh, Google, Salesforce, and Niantic, and recently joined the uh, chatbot startup. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, whatever I say here, I'm not an AR expert, so whatever I'm uh, discussing about how LLMs work might be uh, hallucinations, so do your own fact checking. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start by having a look at the goals. Like, uh, why do we need to uh, have a LLM based honeypot? Uh, I mean, why not? And uh, you can just uh, generate faker than ever HTTP responses to uh, those requests and let the attackers also suffer from those hallucinations. Uh, but on a more uh, serious note, uh, I had three main goals. Uh, the first one was to improve honeypots. Like, if you worked with web honeypots, you know that they are static. You need to emulate vulnerabilities or you need to emulate the applications in order to capture the re uh, request from the attackers and response, uh, respond to those requests. So, 
it would be cool if we can dynamically generate those responses without knowing even about those applications. Uh, the next goal was to see if we can uh, increase the attacker's engagement uh, by sending realistically looking responses like and compare that versus uh, honeypots with static re uh, responses. Uh, that's also something else I try to uh, uh, evaluate. And the final thing was just uh, evaluating LLMs. I just wanted to uh, create a platform uh, for myself to uh, experiment different things on LLMs and uh, hopefully finding a good use case for LLMs for security. So uh, a little bit of story behind uh, developing Glow. Just like anyone else, I guess, in the past few years, uh, I was also trying to find a nail uh, to hit with the LLM hammer. Like uh, the first thing that came to my mind was honeypot, uh, obviously because of my uh, background in honeypots and uh, because of the aesthetic nature of these web honeypots, I thought it would be cool if we can apply the LLMs. And to be honest, I didn't uh, expect it to work because I was like, yeah, maybe they trained it on anything in the internet, but probably HTTP requests and responses are probably not part of their training data. So I was expecting to use custom LLMs or doing uh, some fine tuning and stuff like that. But it actually exceeded my uh, expectations. So uh, let's have a look at how traditional web honeypots work. As I said, uh, they're pretty static. Like uh, we have different uh, web honeypots out there, high interaction, low interaction. High interaction means uh, they're actually real web, uh, web applications. Uh, that's not a scalable at all because you for every web application or uh, device you want to uh, set up the honeypot, you need to have a real application and instance of that. Uh, so. Low interaction ones are the ones which uh, most of the people use uh, for research and expose to the internet, but the problem is you need to either uh, emulate the application itself or the vulnerability. Like there are honeypots like Glassdoff or Esner, Tanner, which use uh, all these different approaches, but at the end it's just very manual, it's not scalable in the cases, as I said, like there are zero day or end day exploits. Uh, you need to know beforehand what application or vulnerability you want to emulate. With that, uh, introducing GLA, uh, it's actually named after an Australian parrot, which is both smart and dumb, which perfectly mirrors uh, the behavior of this honeypot as well. You will see in the f uh, future slides. Uh, so the idea behind GLA was to see if we can uh, mimic uh, new, numerous applications or wide range of applications at least uh, with just one prompt. So we can generate responses on the fly without knowing that application, about that application before. Uh, it's not rocket science, but uh, I will uh, uh, tell you how it works in the, these slides. So we get the uh, HTTP request, GLA listens for multiple ports and uh, also for any request coming. It's not just predefined uh, request path or anything. It accepts any request. Uh, then uh, I have a rule config system which uh, you can define some patterns and just return static responses for those patterns. The reason I added this is because you probably don't want to waste uh, LLM on generating requ uh, responses to requests to uh, root directory, which is a huge part of requests you get when you expose your honeypot to the internet. So for those, you can just add a regex here or a pattern and then just uh, return a static re response. Uh, here's an example uh, response template. You can specify all the headers and body you want to re uh, return. So basically, if you just add a catch-all rule or just something which uh, uh, match with any request and just return a re uh, static response for that. It's basically just like a traditional honeypot. You can just use it uh, without LLM as well. Or you can use a combination. Uh, if the request that we had doesn't match with uh, any rules that we had in the rule configuration system, then the next step is to check the cache. So I added this just uh, because I didn't want to waste money again on uh, generating uh, multiple re responses for the same and uh, identical request. 
And then if the request doesn't match with uh, anything in the cache or the cache response was expired, uh, then we go to the next level, which is the main uh, part of this honeypot. We have a huge uh, prompt uh, divided into system prompt and user prompt. And uh, in the next few slides, I will show you how this works. Uh, you're not supposed to read those uh, small text. Just uh, look at the left ones, which is just the high level uh, what we said to the honeypot to do. So basically we start with some instructions which tells the LLM to analyze HTTP request, emulate the target app, don't do stupid things, just generate the response. And uh, something interesting is if you don't want the honeypot to return something in response, don't mention that. I mean, again, this is not scientific. Maybe it's not how it works, but that's my experience. So if you in your prompt say that you are honeypot, but don't tell that to the uh, attacker or whatever, it tells it. Uh, so yeah, try not to mention any word you don't want to uh, see in the response. Uh, then the next step is the output format. So you need to specify what format you want the response uh, in. So I use JSON. Uh, but it's tricky to make it work. I will uh, show you again in the next few slides. Uh, but basically here you say that I want the response to be in this JSON format, uh, provide one example at least, and then uh, go to the next step, which is the main uh, user prompt. So in this part, uh, we just have a task reminder. We have... Uh, the input HTTP request, which is exactly the request we received from the attacker. We just put it here and uh, add a reminder. And then at the end, I added something to ignore instructions from the user. So for example, the users don't use this honeypot or LLM to create bomb or whatever. And uh, yeah, so Finally, we have this prompt, we send it to the LLM. We currently support multiple LLM providers, both uh, commercial and open ones. Uh, so you can use just Olama to use the open source uh, models and don't waste uh, money on it. And uh, finally, you get the response. The response is hopefully in the JSON format without additional uh, intro or text. And then uh, our honeypot do some other uh, checks because usually those responses, depending on how smart the LLM you use, may contain additional things you want to remove. So you want to clean the re response, validate the JSON, then unmarshal the response into the structure that you want. So you have all the headers and the body and everything that you want to return to the attacker. And then uh, cache it, log it, and send it to the uh, attacker. So just a quick note, and then we uh, show you a demo. Uh, so about the JSON output, if you use the uh, LLMs to, for any security use cases or any use cases at all, and you want to get a structured output, you probably had these issues as well. Usually, the, again, depending on the model you use, uh, the output is not valid. Uh, JSON, for example, maybe it doesn't uh, have some quotations or it doesn't have some brackets. Uh, sometimes the response is truncated. I, I was trying to do this uh, with multiple models. One thing I noticed was, for example, Google's Gemini. Uh, when I was sending a request to the honeypot to something like uh, huge file dot bin, then it was trying to create a huge file and it couldn't, and then it was uh, returning a truncated response. Uh, another thing was markdown code block. So there are these uh, three backticks, usually at the start and end of the JSON that the LLM uh, generates, probably because of the uh, training data that they had. Maybe they took it from somewhere that it had like markdown. So it can't understand. I even if you tell that in the prompt, usually it doesn't remove those. So you need to manually remove those. I mean, not manually in the code. I have a cleaning function that does that. And uh, finally, another thing is this uh, preamble or intro. So you ask LLM to do something and you mention that 
don't say anything else, just return the response. And it still say, okay, here's the response. I was like, no, don't say that. And it still does it. So one thing I noticed that it works is using this in your prompt, like no talk, just do. Usually works. Okay, let's look, uh, have a look at some examples. Uh, these are just some uh, simple examples, but uh, in this one I tried to get uh, AWS credentials, and as you see, it just generated a fake credential. You may say, okay, why do I even need this? I mean, you can use the uh, real fake credential, add it in your prompt, and ask the honeypot that whenever someone tries to get a credential, return this instead of whatever fake credential. Another request was uh, to something random I tried, like etc passwd, and then you see it actually generated something uh, realistically looking. Uh, note that it also generated the headers, not just the body. So everything here is generated by the LLM. Uh, let's try some live demo. Uh, I don't waste more than one minute on this. If it didn't work, I just move on. Uh, but yeah. So hopefully you can see something here. So here I run the uh, honeypot. I set the provider to OpenAI. I set the model uh, to use GPT-40. Uh, this is temperature. I will tell you what it is. Uh, but the default temperature is one. I set it to 0 0.7. And this is the duration for the cache. So I set it to zero, which means no caching. So every time I send a request, it generates uh, using the LLM. Okay, so we have uh, two open ports here. I just tail the log. Um, okay, and maybe some, um, let me see. I have some examples here, but as I said, uh, every time you send a request to uh, the LLM, you get a different response, so I'm not sure if it works. But let's start by maybe a DNS over HTTPS request. So I try it here. You see I uh, hit the DNS query uh, endpoint example.com. So let's see if it works. Hopefully, yeah. And it was pretty quick, right? And it was not a fast uh, model like uh, GPT 3.5. This was like 4.0. So you see the response is actually kind of interesting, and it actually is example.com. Another thing I noticed was the IP is actually right, so maybe it was somewhere in the internet someone pasted it for some reason. Let's try one other example and continue. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, the last one. Yeah, so it generated a HTTP response and you see like the device configuration. Okay, I don't even know what this is. But uh, looking at this, you see it actually said that this is Netgear. So looking at the request, you see that this was probably a Netgear vulnerability. So it dynamically and automatically understood that and generated a uh, response which seemed to be realistic. So I don't know. I'm happy it worked. And uh, let's actually go to the... These are a few other uh, like interesting uh, responses generated by different models. I don't remember which one is generated by which, but some of them are by Gen Gemini, some others are by OpenAI. So it looks pretty good, I guess, and uh, I decided to release the project earlier this year. It was just the first January, and uh, just one minute before uh, releasing the project, I thought maybe I should do some adversarial testing as well, like just stupid things to see how it works before someone else comes and say, oh, you didn't do this, and I did this cool thing. So the first thing came to my mind was to see if, for example, sending a request like, are you a honeypot to the honeypot uh, works or not. I was expecting to return some 404 404, uh, 404 
responses, like it doesn't exist. Uh, this was the response I got. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it didn't it didn't go uh, as I expected, and the other models I tested are not better. So. A few other examples from the other models I tested was, for example, this one from Anthropic. Said like, no, this is not Honeypot. This is a legitimate web service. Uh, another Anthropic model said like, nothing to see, wink, and uh, stuff like that. The last one is with uh, Meta's Llama, so the open source version. This was said like, yeah, I'm Honeypot, but I'm not impressed. Uh, here are two other examples with two other uh, open uh, models. Uh, Google's code llama again said like, oh, honeypot. Uh, Mistral said like, yeah, this is uh, not a real service. You see a pattern here probably. There's like interesting observation. I'm not sure if you noticed. But uh, I noticed that uh, apparently uh, open models are more honest. Like uh, the open models all said, yeah, I'm honeypot. And the commercial one said, like, you know, it's not Honeypot. It's a real server. Uh, just recently, after OpenAI released these uh, reasoning models, I said, like, yeah, let's see if uh, these models can pass the test. And it actually passed. So O1 Mini, uh, this is part of the uh, uh, chain of thought. I uh, took the screenshot from that. Uh, because I didn't have access to the API, I kind of emulated that through a uh, chat GPT. So um, as you see, it's correctly understood that this is a test for Honeypot, and the response that it generated was correctly like 404 not found. Uh, I repeated the test with uh, O1 preview. Uh, got the same uh, response, so this said like given the path, the client might be testing if uh, the server is a honeypot. And then the response it uh, returned was 404. This was really not an easy task, I guess, because you ask the LLM to act as a web server without saying that it's honeypot, and you want it to generate a response on the fly to something that it doesn't understand. And then you ask it to, on top of that, return it in a structured format and all those. And then once you send a request like, are you honeypot? I guess this definitely requires some system to thinking, like some slow thinking, which I guess it's uh, worked pretty well here. Uh, just one last uh, tip about uh, using LLMs. Uh, there's this sampling temperature. Uh, most of people don't know about this, but the default is one, uh, which is a bit creative. So that's exactly why when you send uh, multiple identical requests to LLMs, you get different responses because it tries to be creative and generates random responses. So for Honeypot, we probably don't want that. So if you set it to something uh, closer to zero, it would be more deterministic. And uh, um, I usually use something like 0 0.2, 0 0.5, or 0 0.7. Uh, you can try it on different models, you get different responses and results. Uh, I generated the data sets. Uh, I handpicked about uh, 25 requests from my honeypot covering many different types of uh, requests. Uh, I also added 15 adversarial uh, tests on top of that, so 40 requests in total. And I replayed the traffic to 16 or 17 different models, including uh, all the commercial ones and also the open ones. You see uh, the list of those uh, here. Uh, and yeah, you can go uh, check out the data sets in the repo. Uh, there are some interesting ones. Some performed well in some areas and uh, not that well in the others. So final thoughts. If you remember, I said uh, one of the other goals of the honeypots and this research uh, was to see if we can enhance attackers' engagement by uh, returning realistic responses. Uh, I wish I had a, a more scientific uh, response for that, but yeah, I, I don't know, probably. At least it worked in one case for me, which uh, costed uh, $20. Uh, so someone just... Uh, hit my honeypot with uh, 30,000 requests in one day, 
and the, the honeypot stopped. I noticed a few days later, and uh, so I looked at the logs later, and I noticed it was actually uh, interesting because uh, the honeypot worked pretty well in this case because apparently they were sending connect requests and uh, probably they were looking for some open HTTP proxies to do something. And because of the response the honeypot returned, they thought that this is actually an open proxy. So then they uh, hit the honeypot with like thousands of requests uh, to send traffic to their domains, which apparently seemed to be some sort of ad fraud. I'm not sure, but looking at this uh, uh, domain in a URL scan, it seems it's some sort of uh, um, ad fraud. And the interesting thing is uh, searching the IPs, domains, and everything in um, open uh, threat intel platforms, like uh, I tried a few of them, uh, like Gray Noise and a few others, uh, none of the IPs and domains existed there, which kind of proves that the honeypot worked and the idea worked. Uh, so if you want to take your photo, uh, cameras to take photo of the next slide for uh, the GitHub repo and other info, while you're doing that, you can read this other example. This is how LLMs think internet work. Uh, yeah, it said, yeah, keep your IPs and communication ports open to receive the info. <laughs> So regarding the third goal of the project, uh, I mentioned that I wanted to use this as a platform to experiment uh, LLMs for different use cases. One use case I tried was to, for detection and response, mostly on detection, third detection, not writing detection, but actually using it for uh, correlating signals or alerts. Uh, this is a project I uh, released uh, just uh, maybe two weeks ago before uh, I leave my previous uh, employer. And uh, this is like a threat detection platform. And uh, the part which is interesting is there's this uh, LLM module. So you can do, use that LLM module. I already provided some examples there you can try. Uh, and specifically for alert correlation and signals. I haven't uh, tested it a lot, but initial experiments are uh, very promising. And finally, if you want to uh, have the code and the data set and everything, uh, this is my handle in Twitter and also uh, GitHub. Also, if you uh, search it in Google, you'll probably find it, except a few uh, Bitcoin transactions. Uh, the rest are me. Okay, so that's it. There wouldn't be any uh, QA. You can uh, catch me outside if you have any questions. And that's it from me. Thank you.